Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Gay With God podcast, a safe place for us to share our stories and support one another. How long did we know? What challenges did we face? Did we lose our faith? When did we find our way back home? Or are we still searching? The stories you hear on this podcast will melt your heart and strengthen your belief that in God, all things are possible, and you can be, authentically, gay with the God of your understanding. I am your host, Midge Noble, and I am very honored that you are here. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gay With God podcast. I'm so glad that you're with me today, and I hope that you'll continue to share and subscribe to this podcast so that we can continue to get out good news and that we can continue to be a beloved community. So yesterday I did something brand new. I actually preached in the pulpit in our sanctuary at the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd. So part of this is because I am uh, getting credentialed to be a lay preacher in the Episcopal Church, and I will be winding up this education part um, at the end of this year. And so we have been testing out our little preaching voices, and I've done a few healing service chapel uh, blessed little thoughts, I called them because I just didn't feel <laughs> like I should call them sermons yet. Um, but then the very most awesome uh, Mother Erica, who has been our interim priest uh, the last year, is going to be leaving soon. And she wanted to make sure that as she continued to mentor and support me in this calling that I have, that I would preach in the church before she left. <laughs> so yesterday was my day to preach. So I'm going to share that sermon with you. And then I want to talk specifically about the section in my sermon that talks about being love in action. And let's make that a little bit more present for us so that we can then actually do it. So the sermon was actually entitled Living the Bread of Life. The scripture reading is John 6, 35 and then 41 through 51. John 6, 35, and then verses 41 through 51, if you want to read that first before you hear the sermon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's that time of year again when families are shopping for school supplies and gearing up for another school year. Because this is an exciting time, whether you have raised your children or are the supportive aunts, uncles, and grandparents who have seen the child you love grow from being a tiny infant into their first day of kindergarten. You will remember how eager your child was to get on that school bus like a big kid or how they walked into that school building with barely a wave goodbye to you while you were a puddle of tears in the car. Or maybe you remember the struggle your child had leaving you, clinging to you, crying, screaming at you, and begging you to take them home where they felt comfortable and secure in their familiar surroundings. Change can be really terrifying and hard. As a school counselor, I was on the tears and tantrum patrol the first week of school to gently encourage the heartbroken parents to go ahead and leave so that their child could be supported in a quiet room where they could let it all out and when ready, be redirected by an activity that had been prepared for them. On day one, or sometimes not until day five, I was grateful when these kids were able to come to school without the tears, fears, and tantrums. During those early weeks, I was also terrified as I watched these little kindergartners learn how to carry their lunch trays on soup day across the cafeteria. <laughs> the angle of their trays with that bowl of soup teetering on the edge of that tray while they were walking and looking backwards at the same time, defied gravity. <laughs> I knew guardian angels had to be present when not all of the soup bowls crashed to the floor. It was inspiring to see how these little kindergartners transformed in just one year. 
By the end of the year, most of the little unsure kids who only liked show and tell, nap time, and playing walked into school with more confidence. They could carry their soup bowls on a more level tray, and they were excited about going to first grade to sit in big kid desks and learn stuff their older siblings knew. However, some kids did not enjoy a more structured environment at the end of the year and didn't like the idea of focusing on things they were not ready to do. They were smart and creative, but they just were not ready and needed more time. The school system that I worked at had a special Primary 1 class, or P1 for short. That was a transitional kindergarten class that provided the kids the time they needed to get ready for a more structured environment. This was such a gift to the kids that needed more time to figure things out and more time to explore the world around them without the pressure and expectation to understand things quickly or get left behind. The P1 teachers had a smaller class size and amazing assistance so the teachers could provide students with more one-on-one -on -one instruction and attention and they could do more hands-on activities and the teachers were able to accommodate all the different learning styles of each student so those with a more artistic and creative brain could understand the information. I loved being around these amazing kids and watching them blossom during that extra year, they just needed more time and more repetition to figure it out. In our gospel readings lately, we have heard a lot about bread and Jesus explaining to groups that he is the bread of life. The previous crowd didn't take this message so well and instead of understanding what Jesus was telling them, similar to our kindergartners, they wanted more show and tell, so they asked for another miracle, so they could believe what Jesus was saying. In verse 35 of our Gospel reading today, for the first time in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses an I am statement in his proclamation. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus recognized that his previous message may have been hard to understand, so he is trying to be a little more specific with his I Am proclamation to give them a different way so they could understand who Jesus was. Have you ever come across something that completely overwhelmed you? Maybe it was a story somebody was trying to explain to you, or a new idea, or a new concept. How did you handle that? Did you just accept it? Did you just ignore it? Or did you try to explain it away by something you already knew? This last option, explaining it away by something we already know, is how the crowd dealt with the overwhelming I Am proclamation. In addition to needing more time to understand who Jesus was, the crowd started mumbling about something they already knew, Jesus' credentials. They were Jews who already knew Jesus' mom and Joseph, and they already knew where he came from. And for him to say, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven, not Nazareth, heaven? The crowd just couldn't wrap their heads around that. No matter how Jesus restated his I am proclamation, they needed more time before they could accept who Jesus was. Now, when I say they needed more time, I truly understand how confused they were and why this was so hard. They knew the Torah and the teachings of Moses and how the manna sustained them in the wilderness. And now Jesus is saying that he is the bread of life that will not spoil and they will not die because it is not a physical bread. He is the living bread. That totally blew their minds. I wonder how we would have reacted in this moment. Would we have been ready to accept this message at that time or would we have needed more time? Would we have been angry 
bitter, confused, hostile, and focus on who Jesus' family was instead of the real message. Even though it seems that Jesus is pushing the Jewish community faster than they are ready, Jesus is also demonstrating that he is willing to tell them over and over and in different ways to incrementally help them to understand the full picture that is yet to come. When I think about the bread of life, I can't help but think about this table and what it represents. It represents the risen Christ. We come down here to the altar every week and kneel at this altar. We don't come alone. We come together. We kneel side by side and consume the bread and the blood of Jesus. That bread enters our body and it nourishes us. It fills us with God's love and we experience an inner transformation. We come to this altar every week because we need it. We rely on it. This altar reminds us that Jesus is our source of strength and he keeps showing up for us every week at this altar. Just like he showed up time and time again to help the Jewish community understand who he really was and why he was really among them. We are always able to count on this nourishment from Jesus. He shows up for us in our times of trial, in our grief, in our dark nights of the soul, storms in our lives, and in our questions and confusion. That sacred nourishment transforms us at this altar and gives us the strength to go into the world and be imitators of God who calls us to turn away from anger and slander and bitterness that weaken us and instead as imitators of God we are called to be kind to one another and to live in a state of love the bread of life is a transformational shift from being something out there to in here, in our hearts and souls and minds. We are transformed in that nourishing love that Jesus gave to us by his own flesh. When we collectively walk away from this altar, we are walking back into the world. And right now, the world is a wee bit scary. Maybe we don't feel ready. Or maybe we feel that we need more time. The good news is, we don't go alone. We take Jesus, the bread of life within us, so that we can continue to be nourished by Jesus as we go into the world to nourish others. With the bread of life within us, we can bring unity into a divided world by being love in action. What does being love in action look like? Being love in action looks like extending compassion and understanding for people who are not yet ready to change. It looks like loving and nourishing lost and frightened souls. It looks like praying for people who are bold enough to march for equity and human rights or to be the one marching. It looks like giving people grace when they fall short of our expectations. It looks like outwardly supporting marginalized communities that still face the trauma of bigotry, hate, and racism. It looks like loving people, all people the way Jesus does. With the bread of life within us, we can be the loving hands and feet of Jesus to one another and out in the world. 
So I leave you with this final question. Are we ready to rally together collectively to bring the loving action of the bread of life into our community? Or do we need more time? Amen. So that was my sermon. And I thank Mother Erica for assisting me in clarifying questions I had while writing it and making it as clean as it could possibly be. And my church um, sermon committee that I meet with before I preach and also after I preach to get the pulse of what they're thinking and feeling about the text and also allowing them to give me their own wisdom and experiences and then we put it all together and let the Holy Spirit swirl it around. <laughs> and then I go with what I'm given. And um, I really appreciated everybody's support. And it was a loving and affirming, uh, terrifying moment in my life. But everybody at the church was so gracious and so positive. And I appreciated their feedback. And I heard many stories <laughs> during coffee hour after that of people talking about either their children or themselves and how they were the tears and tantrum kid, but never saw it from, you know, the adult's point of view of having to manage them. And that part of their issue was that were very bright and everybody was so far behind them, actually, that they got bored and they didn't like being in school because... They just didn't have enough stimulation where she went to school. So let's unpack some of these things. Um, the first one example I gave of loving in action is to extend compassion and understanding for people who are not yet ready to change. So to remind us that people, of course, develop at different levels and we can't go any faster than where we're at and we will do better when we know better. And we thank Maya Angelou for that quote. When we are able to give people compassion and understand what journey they're on, and we may not know all the answers, but all we need to know for sure is that we can't push people faster than they're ready and showing up and continue to give them compassion and understanding of where they're at. You've heard that we, we meet people where they're at. And we have to understand, as I've mentioned before here, that there are spiritual pints and spiritual gallons. The more we are able to invest in our own relationship with the God of our understanding, the more we grow spiritually and the more we you know, read the Bible and, and talk to other people and unpack our questions and get some answers and some clarification, we grow. And when we don't, have access to people who we can talk with, or if we don't have an understanding of how the Bible and why the Bible was really written, then we do have questions that kind of lay dormant in us, and we may not grow. Some people are in very horrible situations, and they absolutely are not getting the type of investment into their mind and body and spirit, which stops them from being able to change and move forward or to take another path. So when we sit in judgment of people and we rail against them, we're not taking into consideration where they're coming from and why they may be not understanding how to change for the, for maybe their betterment. Um, the second one that I chose is it looks like loving and nourishing lost and frightened souls. Boy, how many of us right now feel lost and frightened in this political era that we're in and all of the misconceptions and bold-faced lies and evil that fe it really feels that there's some evil swirling around us and being able to be a nurturing presence to other people who are maybe just as frightened as we are, but it's in our in our connections with one another by binding together, even in our fears, at least we have a presence with one another and it helps us to feel better. So, you know, community is everything, I believe, and especially if you have a strong and thriving and loving community, just because you bind together doesn't make you you know, a, a community that can really help and love and nourish frightened souls because you may be 
providing the fear to those folks. Um, but if you are in a community and you know that other people are not doing well, that they're kind of crippled by the fear of what's going to happen, helping them to stay present in the moment, helping them to remember what their lives are right this second. We still may have our job. We may still have enough food. We may still have loving people around us who are supporting us. We may have hope uh, now that things have turned a little bit and we have options. We may have hope. And so being able to continue to accentuate what's still going right and that nothing bad has happened. Nobody's in office that's going to take away your marriage. Nobody's in office right now that's going to stop you from having social security. So we have to stay present in the moment and, and offer the hope that is right now in their day right now to those folks who are feeling lost and frightened. It looks like praying for people who are bold enough to march or doing it yourself. Wow, you know, people have told me that one, they don't march because they did it in the 60s and they're tired. And I get that. And I bless my sisters for, for doing the job they did at the counters in Greensboro, if you knew about the sit-ins in Greensboro, um, and actual marching, um, being trained to not react to violence. They were all a part of that. And uh, they are tired and they deserve to be tired. And so they're not, they're, they're not going to march. They're sitting this one out and they're looking to us, those who are younger than them, I am older than some other people who are marching. Um, so whatever we can do, if you can't march or if you're afraid to march or you can't get off of work to march or you'll lose your job. I mean, we have to take care of ourselves and know what is my fitness level? What is my anxiety? Can I do this and be helpful or will I be a puddle of mess and somebody's going to have to take care of me while I'm trying to march? Um, you know, prayer, I do believe in the power of prayer, and I do believe in collective power of prayer, which gives it like a little boost, I think, a little rocket boost. So if you can't do the marching, as Episcopalians say, use your time, talents, and treasures. And what that means is that if you can volunteer to do things, stuff envelopes, call people, take your time to do that. If you can't do that either and you have money to spare, donate to these worthy causes and help them out so that they can feed the people who are marching or use your treasures to you know, buy things that they need to have bought or to just supplement somebody's salary to do these things. And then your talents. What are you good at? Are you good at social media and you can post and repost things so that everybody can see it? Are you good in other technical ways that they need for computer emails or, you know, sending out notices and that type of thing? So it's not just marching, you know, it's praying also for all of these efforts. So if you're, if you are praying for all the other people who are sharing their time and their talents and their treasures, you're also donating your time in prayer, and that will never be discounted. So the next loving action is supporting marginalized communities that still face the trauma of bigotry, hate, and racism. Now, we are the marginalized community, and yet we're not the only one. So you can either continue from the last one about donating your time, talents, and treasures to also doing that for people who are still in the marginalized communities for our community and other communities. You may be an author and you know that Banned Books Weeks is coming up in September and you are concerned about kids not having the access to information that they should have because they're not allowed to read certain books that have a history that our history that needs to be known and remembered accurately. And you may decide to go to a school board meeting or you may write an editorial speaking about that directly. So there are so many things and causes that we can get pulled into that resonate with our heart. And that's the real part of volunteering and donating our time and talents and treasures is what is laying on your heart. 
I do believe that when we are pulled to care about something, that that is probably the Holy Spirit working in us to move us to something that is meant for us to do. And so if you have a passion for children, if you have a passion for authors, if you don't want their things to be banned, those that might be your calling is to help bring that into the light of day. Whatever you're feeling a nudge to give attention to, follow that nudge and see where that takes you. And you may be right in the middle of helping somebody who has been um, trampled down in our society and not allowed to express themselves freely and openly for who they are. And the last example I gave as loving action is that it looks like loving all people the way Jesus does. Now, this is a hard one. It sounds easy because Jesus did it and, you know, okay, so it's done. And I love all people. Do you? Do I really love all people? Now, y'all know that's not true <laughs> for me <laughs> because I have a huge problem with Mr. Trump. I have a huge problem with the people who are following him blindly and just discounting everybody else. And I am actively working on my prayers for my own heart to open that compassion the way Jesus loves Mr. Trump and the way Jesus loves all of Mr. Trump's followers and how Jesus loves the Proud Boys. Is Jesus loving what they're doing? I don't think so because they're not following what Jesus taught. But does he still love them even when they're not ready to change? Ooh, that popped us right back up to the top one, didn't it? <laughs> so it's true. It's so true that we were there at the top of the, we weren't ready to change. We might have been holding ourselves in a little curmudgeon spot because we were so angry at the way the church treated us and the religious trauma that we've been through. And we were angry at families that kept us in a, place of angst and fear and just hurt for so many so many years so we were not ready to change either and now you're listening to a podcast called gay with god because you've reclaimed your faith or you want to reclaim your faith you're honoring your story or you wish you could honor your story so this is movement for us that we're just even here talking about this. It's movement. If you listened to the first part of this and you got all the way through my sermon, thank you and good for you because some people still don't even want to go into the church building. Some people would not listen to a sermon just because it is a sermon and they don't have any idea what it's going to be about, but it just makes them sick to their stomach and they just can't get themselves to do it. And I understand that and I send compassion and love to them. And I'm grateful that you and I are here and present in doing this together because we've gotten to the other side. But I don't say that in a proud way. I say that in a gratitude way because whew, there were angels and the Holy Spirit working around the clock, I think, on me to get me to the place where I would even enter the door of that church at Good Shepherd, and it took me even months after that to actually go into an actual church service in the sanctuary. And now, <laughs> I've actually preached from that pulpit in the sanctuary. <laughs> I just love it how Holy Spirit works things out. Where are you at at this point? Do you feel ready, or do you feel like you need more time? If you do feel ready, jump into these loving actions and go for it. If you need more time, how would you like to spend that time? Do you need to find a community that can support you in whatever's holding you back from doing these loving actions? Do you need to reach out for a spiritual director or a coach to support you in where you want to go with your life and how you want to put loving action into the world? Are you looking to lean back into church and get more of a deeper relationship with the God of your understanding? Think about what is holding you back from being ready. Honor the space that you're in without shame 
and then start to think about what would be your next logical small small step no big hurrah you don't have to run for office <laughs> you don't have to go and be the first one at the front of the line of the march just what is the next logical small step that you want to take toward getting ready to be loving action in your community we can only start where we are and I hope that you honor that place where you are and that as you continue to move forward you feel really good about yourself and the progress that you're about to make thank you everybody for spending this time with me and honoring me with your time and attention and I appreciate it so very much Feel free to share this with people that you know would be interested or even people that you might want to be interested in this. And remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so that you continue to have this show up in your inbox. You may want to see information and links about me and how to connect with me. And if you do, then please go to the Gay With God show page at empoweredmidge.podbean.com and you will see how to connect with me. Check out our Facebook group called Gay With God, where we do a monthly Zoom group entitled My Faith Journey. And this is a really cool way of connecting to other people who are growing their faith and leaning back into a relationship with the God of their understanding. And for you personally, if you are struggling with your coming out and or faith journey, please connect with me at empoweredmidge.podbean.com. Scroll all the way down to the very bottom of that and you'll see my contact information. You will also see the contact information for me from this podcast that you're listening to right now. It's in, in the show page at empoweredmidge.podbean.com. If you're listening to this podcast and are questioning whether you can be gay and be in a relationship with the God of your understanding, if you identify as LGBTQIA+, are not even sure if you are gay. God has always been within you. Even when you didn't know it, you have always been gay with God. Thank you, everybody. Stay tuned to see how you can join the Gay With God community. And as always, you are loved. I want to invite you to become a part of the Gay With God community. How can you do that? Stay connected by messaging me your thoughts and comments in the comment section under the downloads of the show on the Gay With God show page. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen and share, share, share so we can increase our community outreach and be a light to those who are struggling to claim their faith. Consider being a sponsor so I can highlight your service in our community. We are all worthy of respect and a relationship with the God of our understanding. I want to thank you in advance for supporting this podcast. Together, we as a community will keep this show visible and our community stronger. Deep gratitude to my friend Tim McClendon of Tim McClendon Music for allowing me to use an excerpt from Interlude 4, a song found on his CD entitled Sundance.